Hi, I'm Pastor Brett, as we continue our study in Matthew on the Beatitudes. As we think back over this last year, I think it's fair to say that it's hard to see much peace, whether it be between nation states, whether it be on the streets in our own cities, in our country, and oftentimes in our own hearts. There's a lot of people that are very fearful, restless, and on edge. And yet Jesus challenges us as believers to be peacemakers, whatever our sphere of influence may be. You could ask the question, when he calls us to be peacemakers in verse 9, is that between God and man, or is that between man and man? I think the answer to that is it's both. I think traditionally it's been more man to man um, down through history, but definitely the verses that it refers back to, the ideas it refers back to, you have the idea that you can't have peace between men um, without having peace of God with God. I think we're far enough into the study that I just kind of like to reread um, the beginning um, Beatitudes. So, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And then our verse today, Blessed are those who are um, peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Now, just as a reminder, we see eight declarations of blessedness that's spoken by Jesus right at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. And um, if you had to define blessedness, it probably has the idea of happy, blissful, but it literally means to be enlarged. So these blessings are to enlarge you. Um, and in each one, we see that God um, is the one that is giving the blessing. So right before the peacemaker is the purity of heart. So it gives you the idea that you, when you have the purity of heart, it's going to lead you into the desire to be more of a peacemaker between man and also between man and God. Um, and we don't want to think that we are doing it because it's really a divine work. To try to do peacemaking without God and having Christ in the center of it is going to be pretty hopeless. Um, in, Ma in Romans chapter 5, 1, it says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's Christ that brings that blessedness and peace between us. And we also should notice that in this verse it says, gives us the idea that everybody should be a peacemaker, not just some of us, but each of us as we pursue our holiness in God and our purity of heart, um, that should lead us into um, wanting to be a peacemaker. So not only is it a divine work, but it is a work of a Christian who is following God. The very same verb of peace here we find also in Colossians 1.20, where the Apostle Paul applies it to the work that Christ did to bring peace between man and God. It says in verse 20, And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood on his cross. So, um, again, we do not want to lose the um, view that we aren't the peacemakers, but it truly is God working through us. So we're called the sons of God as we pursue peacemaking, and we all know that God loves reconciliation. It means so much so that he gave his only begotten son to reconcile us. And so when we carry the message of Jesus, that message is going to bring peace between man and sinner. And ultimately, who is the Prince of Peace? Well, that is Christ himself. Isaiah 52, 7 says, How beautiful upon the mountain are the feet who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, Your God reigns. We have to be careful when we work peace, with others that we don't bring a cheap peace. And what I mean by that is that a worldly peace, a peace that is attempted without Christ in the middle of it 
is going to be just a temporary peace. Um, literally, it's going to be temporary lull in the chaos and not bring about anything permanent. Um, another thought to have about this is that real peace usually comes with a price. Look at the price that Christ paid on the cross to bring price be or peace between man and God. In the same way as we as Christians want to enter into uh, other people's relationships, or even if you're in the position nation states, it's going to um, bring sometimes pain and sacrifice into your own life. But God says it's well worth it, and that, matter of fact, we're commanded to be peacemakers, and so that we should pursue it. But don't reel back if it is costly, if it does cause pain or sacrifice on your part, because that's oftentimes part of the process if you want true peace. The Greek here has a translation in, uh, in a positive, I mean, I'm sorry, in a passive structure. So basically, when it says, they shall be called the sons of God, that predisposes that there's another actor and that you are God's instrument and that he is the actor that is bringing peace. Um, actually, four of the Beatitudes contain verbs with passive voices, the passive voice, rather. Um, it is God who will uh, comfort those who mourn in 5.4. It is God's action that fully satisfies those who long for righteousness in 5.6. And it is God who will grant mercy to the merciful. And then in 9, we see God will declare peacemakers to be the children of God. So as we consider about being peacemakers, we should challenge ourselves each day to look within our own sphere of where we can be enabled by God to be used in that process and challenge ourselves to be full of spirit, to be living pure lives as much as we can, and to not be afraid if it's going to be costly to bring peace to those relationships around us. Thanks for uh, spending some time with me.